Welcome to Real Vision Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, we talk crypto and investing with Ryan Alice, managing partner of Heart Rhythm and publisher of CoinStack on Substack. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Before we get started talking about crypto, let's give us uh, a sense of your background, uh, particularly your background as an investor before you got involved in the crypto space. So I started out as an entrepreneur on the East Coast of the United States. I built a software company called iContact for, for 10 years as CEO and founder. We, we had a great exit in 2012, sold it for about $169 million to a public company. And then I was, I was young. I was 27 at the time, decided to go back to school, did an MBA at Harvard Business School 2013, 2014. And then after school, I moved to San Francisco and became an angel investor. I uh, invested in uh, about 33 different companies. Some, some of the winners were SpaceX, uh, Lending Club, Change.org, Matterport, uh, Robinhood, and then about 25 other losers as well, uh, as happens in angel investing. Um, and at the same time, I was building a, a global community of leaders making a positive impact in the world called Hive.org, uh, which is still around today. It's a little bit on pause due to COVID. And then over the last two years, I've been focusing on crypto, building CoinStack newsletter, and then joining as a managing partner here at the crypto hedge fund Heart Rhythm. So tell us a little bit about what drew you to crypto. Obviously, someone with your background, you could have done anything you wanted to with your life. Why investing in crypto? Well, you know, I was early in the software as a service revolution back in 2002, 2003, and, you know, coming out of growing up with AOL and Prodigy and CompuServe and the Web 1.0 of the Internet, um, I, I was excited to sort of build a company in the Web 2.0 space in the, in the 2000s and 2010s. Back in 2020, I read a book called The Infinite Machine, which is by Camila Russo, which is about the founding story of Ethereum. And, you know, I invested a little bit in Bitcoin in 2017. Back in 2013, I bought a Bitcoin miner, but sadly never plugged it in and gave it away to a friend. And so I had, I had some, some exposure to the Bitcoin world. Um, but when, when the markets crashed in, in early 2018, I sort of uh, wrote off the entire crypto space for two years. And it wasn't until 2020 when I started to read about uh, these smart contracts and how they were underpinning this new form of global finance called DeFi that I became very interested in and started to realize, wow, this is Web3. This is the next generation, the next revolution. And I want to be a part of this. And so that's when I got heavily into Ethereum and heavily into investing. Well, you know, I'm glad I'm not the only one. I spun up my first Bitcoin blog, I think in 2013, we started it. And again, sort of as you did, uh, lost interest in it because maybe I got misled by the price action. Uh, it's really a fascinating transition in your thinking that you mentioned there. What was it about Ethereum and the nature of smart contracts that seemed to you, someone with a software as a service background, to have real potential to rebuild the foundations of the internet itself? It's a great question. You know, ultimately, uh, Bitcoin is somewhat speculative. It is a technological platform. It's a distributed database, of course, and, and a ledger. But at the end of the day, without having the smart contract functionality natively on Bitcoin, you can't really build applications on top of it. And so um, you, you can think of uh, Bitcoin as the TI-83 calculator. You can think of Ethereum as sort of the, the web browser where you can build all types of applications within it. And that was really interesting to me. And, and having, you know, grown up in a world where um, in order to do a stock trade, you know, you have to trade during these certain eight hours a day that New York is open. It takes two days for the stock to settle in order to send a wire to another country. It takes three to four days. You know, I, I'm interested in, in how we create the new financial system that everyone can be part of. And so when I saw a, a true software development platform, with Ethereum and then uh, Ethereum's cousins and competitors that are now springing up very quickly, which we can speak about, I started to get really interesting and, and, and sort of said, hey, this is the future. I want to be part of it. Bitcoin is the TI-83. Man, we're to get some comments uh, on that one. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, though, uh, you know, you talk about this current landscape, uh, Ethereum and its competitors. How would you describe uh, the current framework that you see in the world right now uh, in terms of smart contract platforms, L1s and L2s. How do you describe that ecosystem and how do you think about it? Yeah, so it's it's a great question. L1 obviously means layer one. 
L2 means layer two. Uh, L1 is sort of a synonym for a blockchain, if you will. That's all that really means. Ethereum is by far the first and largest uh, smart contract L1. Uh, and it currently has, if you look at DeFi Llama, it currently has 62% of the total market share for all the total value locked in DeFi. And so Ethereum is certainly by far the largest and most well known. And there are some L2s. Uh, you could you could look at some of the side chains and rollups. You could look at Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Rollup, ZK Porter that have come out in 2021 and now in 2022 that are making Ethereum scalable, making it faster, making it cheaper, and allowing DeFi applications to be used by the masses, not just by institutions who can afford the multi-hundred dollar gas fees of the mainnet Ethereum. So that's what's going on in, in the Ethereum and the L2 world, but then now there are these other competing smart contract platforms. And I'll, I'll share uh, you know, a little bit of data here about these smart contract platforms um, in terms of their total value locked and then the number of developers, you know, right now, if you look on DeFi Llama, the top six are Ethereum, Terra, Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, Solana, and Phantom. And so numbers two through six there are all growing faster than Ethereum in terms of developers and in terms of total value locked. Uh, and I certainly have a personal investment in all six of those. And I'm particularly excited by Terra, Avalanche, Solana, and Phantom. And what they have done is they've they've taken a trade off many of them to allow for less decentralization but faster speed which is allowing for them to be able to handle a higher transactions per second and to be able to handle defi at scale uh, where the gas fees are much much lower so obviously a lot there we can have a three-hour conversation i think on just your last statements there but let's try and break this down broaden the conversation bring people in uh, who are relatively new to the space and still struggling to get their heads around it. Two questions to you, Ryan. Uh, first, talk a little bit about the current state of play uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem and what some of the challenges are in terms of scalability, in terms of speed, in terms of gas fees, costs, uh, that make some of these other solutions so appealing to you. And second, uh, you made reference in passing to the trilemma. Can you break that down for our viewers and explain what those trade-offs are and why they're significant and how you think about those uh, trade-offs in your investing decisions? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, let, let's start by just talking about Ethereum. I, I think it's best, the best metaphor you can use to think about Ethereum is the global settlement layer. And so, um, you know, the, the Bankless podcast guys, they, they created this concept of the mainnet Ethereum being the Manhattan real estate and all of the side chains and the other layer twos and other layer ones uh, being sort of the the outer boroughs of real estate where there's not as much price, there's not, not as much cost because the location isn't as good. Now, if you're Visa and you're settling a couple hundred million dollars a day uh, in transactions, you're going to use the Ethereum blockchain. And in fact, Visa does use the Ethereum blockchain because they don't care about the $200 fee that they're going to have to pay to make that $200 million daily settlement. Now, if you're uh, trying to do a $10 DeFi transaction, uh, and you're not going to want to pay that $200 fee. You know, right now, just to do a Uniswap trade on the Ethereum network, you're looking at $100, $150, depending on the moment. And so you just can't do small trades on Ethereum. Now, a lot of people will criticize Ethereum and saying, you know, gas fees are too darn high. Uh, Ethereum is, is, you know, that proves that Ethereum is useless. Well, the, the, the truth is actually inverse. People are paying, institutions are paying over $50 million a day in revenues to Ethereum. It was $9.9 .9 billion in total revenues for 2021 to the Ethereum blockchain. Yes, the fees are high, but the fees are high because they're, it's actually being utilized. And people are actually willing to pay in that public auction that happens with every block every few minutes on the Ethereum network. Now, with the trilemma, the second part of your question you know, that that's, of course, there's a trade off between security, decentralization um, and speed. And so, you know, what Ethereum is trying to do and is doing since they launched in 2015 is they have a 10 year roadmap. Uh, Vitalik was on uh, a couple weeks ago saying that they feel like they're about 50 percent done with their roadmap of Ethereum. And fortunately, we now have this is the year that Ethereum is getting upgraded to the proof of stake 
system that's probably coming in mid-year this summer. Uh, best estimates right now are June or July of 2022. And when that upgrade happens, um, it's going to uh, be able to completely change the consensus model of the entire blockchain and uh, make revenues go to the Ethereum holders that are staking it. And so it's a very exciting upgrade. And then after that, the last part that will probably happen mostly in 2023 is the sharding and is the ability to um, have 64 simultaneous versions of the Ethereum blockchain instead of just the one that we have today. So those upgrades are coming. Um, and what's happening is in the meantime, all of Ethereum's competitors are primarily making a trade-off in decentralization in order to increase the speed and provide much lower gas fees. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.